real estate, crypto, stocks, and bonds, gold outperformed them all in 2022. So what are you waiting for? Noble Gold Investments has helped thousands of clients buy real physical gold. Open a gold IRA or a silver IRA with Noble Gold Investments this month and receive a free quarter ounce American Gold Eagle coin with every qualified IRA of $50,000. You can't go wrong with Noble Gold Investments and their thousands of five-star reviews. If you're not ready to invest, download the Noble Gold Investments Gold Investment Guide. Scroll down below and you'll find the link in the description box. For mobile users, click the More button to find the link. Hey, Inspire Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, it's John Nolan here. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to another inspired conversation. And uh, today, before I welcome our guest, uh, we have listened to you. The many comments, the many emails, the many questions that were asked over the time, where are the real white hats? Well, today we're going to uh, have a conversation with a real white hat, a real life white hat that does amazing work uh, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, all over the place, and has been at it for many years, uh, a true freedom fighter and light worker uh, and freedom warrior. And um, before we bring him on, I want to tell you that because of his uh, contractual obligations with a news network, he can be on camera, but we will have his audio loud and clear, and you will be blown away by the stories he has to share. Welcome, uh, retired Brigadier General Blaine Hold. Thank you so much for joining us today, Blaine. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you, John. Thanks for having me. Oh, the honor is ours. And uh, Blaine, when... You know, when I uh, when I was first introduced to you and your work and I went to look at your resume at your uh, history in the military, it's an extensive, impressive record. The awards, the missions, everything you have done. Uh, thank you for your service, sir. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I, I would say thank you for your taxpayer dollars because they fueled my adventures. And that's what <laughs> that resume really represents. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Um and uh, I would kind of like to start there because uh, as far as I remember, you are the first high ranking uh, military member that, that is coming on the Inspired channel. And uh, why we're so excited about this is because uh, people are beginning to realize that white hats and, and everyone out there that is doing their part is a white hat, but white hats are truly everywhere now. The awakening is going through all levels uh, of the human family. And perhaps you can give us a little bit of a background of your 30 years in the military and how that, um, you know, became the work that you're doing today. Oh, I sure will. And and to your first point, it is amazing to see across the nation the awakening that we see in it. It's everybody. It's red, blue, Democrat, Republican, um, you know, llamas are waking up. It's just wonderful to see across this nation where everybody understands things aren't quite right. Things aren't really right with our union. They haven't been for some time. And and really, there's no one coming. We, the people, actually have to solve our own problems, which kind of gets to my story. Um, you know, uh, 27 years in the Air Force, ROTC kid, all I ever wanted to do was fly jets. And it was probably maybe three to four years going into that career that you know, we had that first Gulf War and I really started to understand the gravity uh, and the responsibility that comes with being a commissioned officer in my country's service. And then that oath that every single time we're promoted, we take that, we raise our hand, we take that oath that says, I will support and defend the Constitution, not a person, not some party, uh, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I, I know I'm speaking broadly for 17 million veterans who have given service to this nation. But most of us take that oath very seriously. And most of us uh, consider that oath to be without expiration. And so in my post Air Force life where I'm creating businesses and I'm providing opportunities and I'm trying to capitalize on these things that I've learned, um, I, I am really called back to service in a way um, that, you know, tries to, um, motivate people to understand that their liberties are precious, that they come from their creator, not some state or some administration, and uh, and that we have to embrace them and defend them. Uh, General, there's, there's if you look at, and, and I did, I looked at, as I said, at your resume on the Air Force website, which is up there. Um, there's one, there's a few things that stand out that are kind of red flags to people. 
And I wanted to take the opportunity to also show that, you know, you have worked closely with NATO. I mean, you had a very a key position in the military with regards to NATO. You work with the Council of Foreign Relations. You work with the North Atlantic Council and other organizations that are oftentimes uh, connected to the bad guys, if you will, or nefarious actions in the world. And um, can you speak a little bit about that experience and how you were able to have maybe even positive influence within those organizations? I absolutely can. And I, I again, I'm very, very blessed and grateful for the experiences that I've had. So we, we can go there. But first, I might draw your attention to what would be my second favorite piece of literature and writing, Rudyard Kipling's If Poem. And in that poem, one of those things states, you know, if you can walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. And, and I always try to keep that in my mind because, you know, I, I'm just a kid who grew up in Georgia and I've, I've had some really amazing experiences in, in, in the military with flying. And after my time in, in, the, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, putting together a, a war-torn country, I find myself at the Council on Foreign Relations you know, around all of these folks, many of whom are absolutely globalist elites, many of whom hang their hats at Davos. Um, names everybody would understand, like Kissinger, Soros, uh, uh, senators and congressmen that are always out there in the news, like McConnell, uh, Schumer. Um, there, I, I was rubbing elbows with a lot of these folks. But I think that, you know, we could, you know, say there's bad guys and good guys, I would say that there's uh, agendas that are absolutely nefarious. But unless, uh, you know, what a blessing for me to get a front row seat and to actually engage in conversations and debates often with these folks um, to learn more about how they think and what they do. And I, I kind of felt that this was really a gift given to me to get a front row seat to some of this stuff rather than sit on the outside and speculate um, what they're all about, what their agendas are about. And, um, and then as a deputy representative to NATO, <laughs> even though my three-star boss was uh, an officer that I absolutely adored, respected, and loved, I used to categorically tell people that, well, the one-star level, which was my rank, one-star general, the one-star level at NATO is the last place where truth truly exists in that building. And then after that, it's very political. But but what I can say is about, about NATO, if, if I'm to put a good news story to NATO, and I think NATO's going through some very hard times right now and certainly did at the end of the Afghanistan war. Um, since the end of World War II, you've had an alliance that has rules that all those countries have to sit down face to face, whether they like it or not, five times a week and discuss issues, problems. And we never had that. And, and we have never enjoyed 75 years of relatively uninterrupted peace in Europe. So if there's an accomplishment that NATO can really hang its hat on, it's not that it delivered leopard tanks to Ukraine. It, it's more about we set up a vehicle where um, we could drop miscalculation and misperception on the world stage. And unfortunately, NATO itself has fallen into political agendas that bring us to these places now that I think are getting increasingly dangerous. But, but on the whole, when I look at my career, I have had healthy doses of walking with the kings. And uh, I've always been very, very grounded of uh, walking around with folks that I have, you know, loaded aircraft with, flown jets with, uh, maintained aircraft with, and 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 people across our country that come from our country, and and I think for me it's it's just been a a, a great um, gift uh, as we go forward into these next places where I might be able to help wherever I can. I think in in our conversation so far, and what I have read and, and seen from you, what I what I love about your perspective is first and foremost, it's always inspiring. It always has an inspiring touch, even when you go into hard truths, which, you know, um, coincidentally works with the name of this channel. But uh, <laughs> right. an another thing that I, that I also appreciate deeply is that truth is never complicated. Truth is simple, but it's nuanced and it's complex. And um, like what you just said, you can't just have a, a black and white perspective on things. There is always nuance. 
And there was a conversation you shared with me that you had, I believe, within the Council of Foreign Relations, um, where you um, basically, in, in, in maybe not as harsh terms, but you said someone straight about um, how the model that these people so often want to project upon whole nations like the United States mm -hmm. really works with the character of the people of the United States. Can you share that story with us? Oh, no, I absolutely will. Um, I, I had the ability to sit in on a, a meeting at the council. It was a night meeting, I remember. And Alan Greenspan was our speaker. And he was giving us what we call the World Economic Forum Roundup. And um, the, 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 the argument chair, chairman of the Federal Reserve. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and while that that was, you know, amazing to sit here and watch this uh, uh, leader who's made all these decisions at the Fed as the Fed chair, he was really speaking to this thing called quantitative easing, which is a fancy way of saying we're buying back our own paper, um, but there's going to be cascading problems that come from that. One of those ended up being Arab Spring, in my opinion. But what he warned everybody about was that he could envision a world where the United States would lose world reserve currency status and that we should all just prepare for that and that China was very adamant about taking that away. Now, um, those words were prescient because we see a lot of that happening at the very highest strategic levels now. The what we call the BRIC countries, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and maybe Saudi Arabia soon, uh, they are having discussions about disintermediating or getting rid of the dollar as the reserve currency. And quite honestly, that changes things for us dramatically if they were to achieve such a thing. But that, that, that wh where I was, was sitting next to um, <laughs> a banker that I thought, you know, he's a really nice person. We, we, we were friends. And I leaned over to him and I said, well, you know, you guys give yourselves a lot of credit. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? And I said, I think, I think you all think that the banking community actually is on the front lines of determining whether the dollar is the reserve currency or not. And, and what I'm here to tell you is, if that were the case, oh, I think just around 1913 or just around the end of World War II, we would have lost that status. Um, certainly in 1973 when we came off the gold standard. Um, but, but it's not because of you bankers. That's not the reason that we hold the world reserve currency. And he said, oh, I see. <laughs> so, and then one of the world's top elites, which, you know, uh, probably don't need to say his name on this channel, but um, he, he is a billionaire and he's got his fingers in the pots of just about everything. He, he started taking an interest in this because he was sitting right in front of me and he turned around. And um, I told my banker buddy, and I said, well, um, the reason that the United States holds world reserve currency is because of a document. And that document is the United States Constitution. And it is the, to date, best, most perfect governance document that the world has produced. And it puts the United States into an enviable position of being the honest broker or the only game in town, or, or at least the most honest broker. And, and so transacting in dollars um, is why people do that, because there is the full faith and credit of the United States, which to date means something. Uh, but that's based on our laws and our rule of law. And it's not based on banking engineering or financial engineering. And if you go down the street here in New York to the Fed of New York and you go see where all the nations have put all their gold uh, in the vaults there, there is a reason they didn't do that in their own country. And so I, 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 I just think it's very cute that you, <laughs> you, you come to this conclusion. So then the billionaire is getting really worked up. He's very red in his face. And he said, who the heck are you? <laughs> I said, I am Colonel Blaine D. Holt, United States Air Force. And if you'd like to uh, have a chat, I'm I'm totally up for it. <laughs> so how many people would love to have been in my shoes to be able to have that debate and, and argue that on behalf of we the people? Because actually, it's we the people who are the boss in this country. We're a self-governed people, regardless of what the elites and the globalists would have you believe, um, regardless of the big statements that they say at Davos. Um, quite honestly, anytime we want, we can just assert ourselves and decide, nope, it's our country. Our rights come from our creator. 
that's the way it is. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how much money you have. Which I think is extremely empowering to hear that from someone who's spent so much time in, in an apparatus that oftentimes forgets that, right? And especially within these organizations, their their modeling and their ideas oftentimes take over and they don't really pay attention to what is really happening and how the people really think. And perhaps they don't even care. But uh, what stands out to me also is, uh, General Holt, that um, the military, as a as a general uh, idea, you know, has a very strong uh, tendency to program its members because, to a certain extent, all the extensive training and the missions and the focus and everything, and you know, people need to have within the military comes through that programming. It's astonishing to me that you told me uh, off camera how your awakening journey happened, and oftentimes I see that. In, in veterans after they leave the military, but for you it happened during um, your tenure, during your active duty work in the military. And you said a turning point for me was Kyrgyzstan. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and your awakening journey? Sure. Uh, I, you know, jokingly refer to my year in Kyrgyzstan as my Saul to Paul conversion. <laughs> I went, I went to, I was assigned to command this wing at a pivotal time. The, the setup was this corrupt regime, which was making money hand over fist. Uh, the Bakiev regime um, was evicting us uh, as a base in Central Asia uh, from pressure from Moscow, pressure from Beijing. And uh, they didn't want the base there anymore. And I was being sent there not to roll it up and get rid of it, but rather um, the president is about to approve the surge in Afghanistan for General McChrystal and General Petraeus. And my job was not only to secure the base and to uh, get the Kyrgyz to buy into keeping us, but to triple the capacity of that wing. So I went there with the idea of I'll deal with the political situation with the ambassador. I will, I will then turn my wing on its head and really sharpen that blade and, and get them better in every facet of their military support for the war. And... <laughs> And I got there. And two weeks after that, no, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. I, that's a truism that's always going to be with me. But, but when I got there, this wonderful, wonderful lady, uh, she was my senior by quite a few years, but she was my Kyrgyz translator was her job at the time. And, um, you know, I sat down in frustration because the parliament had not yet approved us. And I just looked at her and I said, what is up with Kyrgyzstan? I said, um, you know, we spend this much money every year, millions of dollars every year to be here. What, what is this? And she said, well, um, it may come as a surprise to you, but the Kyrgyz people can't stand Americans. And I said, now, how is that even possible <laughs> with all the support we're giving this country? And then, and then it got me. She said, well, all your dollars go to the regime. They don't go to us. And your very few jobs for Kyrgyz people on this base don't really help our economy that much. So you give yourselves a lot of credit and you think you're doing a lot, but your occasional shopping trips downtown are not really, you know, making a difference for us. We thought this would be this. We thought there'd be this wonderful relationship after 9-11 and it never came. And I said, aha. And I started reviewing relationships. And then I started reviewing my role in the country. And I, I looked myself in the mirror and I said, didn't they give you colonels to work for you and to run this military mission? And shouldn't you now go <laughs> to where you're needed? And I've got an extensive foreign affairs and, and, and you know, lingual background. And so I got her to help me learn Kyrgyz in about three months. Conversationally, I could make speeches in Kyrgyz. And I basically avoided the politicians except for one politician once a week. And then I went into every walk of life in Kyrgyzstan, rebuilding our relationships, getting our airmen out the door, building schools, not with contract money, but together, helping communications companies downtown get better at making high-speed internet and then selling it back to us. Um, basically just changing the entire equation there. And nine months later, that all paid off because we had a, a violent, bloody revolution, a massacre. The regime was being deposed, and I helped install the uh, next leader based on these relationships that we had from 
entrepreneur programs for women. And, uh, and I really walked away after the last Peace Corps volunteer was saved in a big ethnic cleansing thing that was happening in the southern part of the country. I really walked away after that year saying, uh, with a complete fresh perspective on seeing the world through other people's eyes, not American eyes as we would see them. And that made all the difference for me. It made me much have a much deeper understanding of the geopolitics in the world that I, I work on. And I'm very grateful. I think it's an incredible story. And when you first uh, told it to Christine and I, I remember I asked you during all your military travels, what was your favorite country to, to have visited and, and been to? And you said Kyrgyzstan. I said, I didn't expect that at all. But of course, <laughs> when you shared the story and your experiences and you have, you've had plenty of um, inspiring experiences, but um, you also told us that at the end of your tenure there, uh, you were basically told by your uh, military superiors, well, you, you, you know, you're turning into a Kurg here. You gotta, you gotta move on. You're too close. Is that true? Can we share it, that? <laughs> it is. So um, I did ask for another year in command there. Um, we were doing so well after the revolution in rebuilding trust and relationships. This is an incredibly important place for us to have a base. I mean, it's a rough neighborhood. The gang is all there. You've got China, Russia, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, all the narco terrors going on there. So, wow, this is great. And the Kyrgyz really were um, upbeat about the relationship and, and more permanentizing it. And, uh, but my boss and, you know, my mentor, General Petraeus, he was like, Blano, you've, you've actually gone native and we're, we're going to bring you home. <laughs> and I said, there's, there's Lawrence of Arabia and then there's Blano of Bishkek. And, <laughs> um, and he said, uh, listen, you, you, you're, you built yurts, you are hauled into ceremonies in villages, you sometimes wear, the robe, you speak Kyrgyz. And I was like, all these things are necessary for a healthy relationship. <laughs> and he was just like, Blaine, you're going to get to go to the Council on Foreign Relations where you can reflect and write about this. And I said, okay, boss, I got it. I got it. But I keep my relationships up with the good folks and friends in Kyrgyzstan to this day and uh, love them dearly. Um, you know, we always recount these wonderful stories from getting the school done, getting the surprise school bus at the end of the school year into the hands of the school or building a roof for the high school for the mayor of Manas, or even me defending him to be reelected in this little village where the villagers had had it with him. And uh, just so many little anecdotes that really kind of changed how I, I just look at everything. Incredibly inspiring. And I introduced you, um, you know, as one of the real white hats out there. And, you know, it's not necessary that anyone toots his own horn or that we bring that out so much. But uh, you and I in, in, in conversations have also talked about this idea that there is a secret group out there and it is behind the scenes steering everything and they're in control and they're the good guys, the white hats. And um, we shouldn't worry. We shouldn't do anything or we don't have to do anything. We can just watch this movie unfold. And, and you and I um, share the perspective that um, it's probably not true, but even if it were true, inaction cannot be the, the, the course forward. So after you, after you left the military, um, how did your life unfold? And I know you said, um, you know, my plans and, and the purpose that, is, that was created for me are not, every, you know, are not always aligned. So, so how did your life play out after the military? So my big idea here in changing over from military to civilian life is, look, I, I was trained for 30 years on how to destroy stuff. I'm going to spend 30 years on how to create things. And business seemed like the greatest way to do that. And so I, ha I got into an aviation company turnaround. I did some startup work. I'm, I'm, I'm selling a startup company that I had uh, now, and I'm building another company, an aerospace company right now. Um, and that really was the path that I wanted myself to be on. However, um, then we get to this place called COVID. And, you know, we, we, we look at the things and the events that start to transpire. Well, I've got a strategist's mind and I can't help but 
put puzzle pieces together. It's just what I do. If you put a Rubik's cube in the room with me, it won't be long before it's in my hands and I'm trying to figure it out. And the way that it started to click for me was we had the lockdowns then, and, and none of that made sense to me because emergency powers, and there is no, there's no pause on the constitution. None of this stuff was legal in my view. But then other things started to happen. As soon as the BLM Antifa raising of our cities happened, and then we moved into, oh, well, we, now we better have uh, um, ballot boxes and, and ballot harvesting and all this other nonsense about how do we run the processes of the country. Um, it, it really became very clear to me that there was a campaign or, or some wheels in motion that Americans couldn't see. And so I prayed, as we all should do. I highly recommend that for everybody every day. And my prayer was, hey, listen, Lord, I've, I've got some great gifts it, that you've put in my pocket over the years. Whatever this is going to be, whatever's coming, let's just, just put me in. Just put me in. Let, uh, let me get into this thing. And we blast forward after, you know, the November 2020 stuff, me and a and a fellow veteran, a lieutenant colonel uh, that who I just adore, um, Darren Gobb, retired. He's in Montana. We had great talks about our groups and the history of the United States. And so we came together in uh, uh, northern Idaho to just kill a lot of butcher paper and draw up the plans for our organization, which is called Restore Liberty. And Restore Liberty is about reminding every American, not blue Americans or red Americans, what our constitution is, the power of it, the powers in it, and, and, and our rights and where they come from. And so we just basically picked up shovels and in very short order, we got ourselves in 40 states and we've got people inspired now all over the world who are a part of this network, much the same way that in 1775, we had the Sons of Liberty that in the taverns, they had a system of systems. Well, we're doing the same thing. And it's in, it's inspiring to me every day. And I get juiced because we get great information from all these groups that we're affiliated with. And so when people see a train derailment, we get the backstory. We get the other stuff that's going on. And, and I think this rolls back to where you started your point, which is I've never been a believer in the concept, no matter who's saying it, no matter what platform's saying it. Um, just trust the plan, sit back, go shopping, uh, watch the movie, whatever that's about. That's not, that's not what our framers ever intended. Benjamin Franklin said it best. You have a republic if you can keep it. If you well, can keep it, yes. It's our, our calling to keep it. And what I don't want us to be, I don't want us to be the generation of Americans that failed our founders or our grandkids. I don't want to, I don't want to be in that group. And so the nice part is the framers, they had to fight violently for their freedoms to gain freedom, but to restore liberty, all the tools are right there in the constitution for us. And that's what we promote at Restore Liberty. Uh, one thing that our viewers today can't see, but where you're sitting right now, behind you on your wall, um, there is Native American uh, art. And uh, because it is part of your heritage, part of your history, and there's one thing that I'm 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 seeing now more often, and it's coming out clearer that like yourself and others in in a group that we're both connected with uh, that are doing amazing work, a lot of this energy, a lot of this uh, heritage energy is coming back and is infusing the work of yourself and others positively. You have Native American heritage. How does that culture and that wisdom play into your work? It it is. It's so cool, John. It it's interwoven throughout my whole life. My family um, is a trail of tears family. Um, you know, we kind of we're spread from uh, Georgia all up through Tennessee, Kentucky, down into Arkansas, Oklahoma for a reason. <laughs> and um, one of my grandfathers, I have two Cherokee Indian kings in my uh, my lineage chief path killer and then before him during revolutionary war times chief okanosta but chief path killer and i i always think about him and i always go back to him 
especially when I think about my time in Kyrgyzstan, because these were the folks, and they will tell you in Kyrgyzstan, hey, we're the first Americans. We're the ones that came over on the land bridge, and this is where you got some of your tribes from. But but Chief Pathkiller, um, he was an interesting man. Andrew Jackson commissioned him to be a colonel in the United States Army to be a part of the War of 1812. Now, things politically for the Cherokee never really worked out the right way. They supported the the British in the Revolutionary War. They they supported um, the South in the in the in the Civil War. Um, but that notwithstanding, if if you can think about how devastating it would have been to my great 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 grandfather to hear the news that after being victorious in the battles that the Cherokee were given in the War of 1812, then President Jackson would turn around and enact the uh, the tribal movements out of Georgia and and going west to Oklahoma, um, but 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 think about that for a second. You've got here a commissioned army officer who also happens to be the last Cherokee Indian king, and now he's getting a bird's eye view to how government can turn on you in a second because it's an institution and it's made of men, um, but it's and women, but it's not our creator who imbues our rights to us. And it's not um, the creator that we were taught by our grandfathers, especially in the Native American traditions, that um, family, our communities, our environment, the outdoors, caring and stewarding our environment and our communities, that ultimately these are the foundations that matter. And what I love and what I'm seeing, and you and I talked about it, is there's this rebirth of these ideas and these concepts and the great tribes that cover our nation, um, you know, from the Iroquois all the way across to the West here, the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Um, it's, it's amazing how first principles seem, people seem to be coming back to that. To me, it, it, it's always been, and we, we talked about this as well. And Christine and I, we talk about this a lot is we've always felt that the, uh, reunion of the cultures the melting and the um reintegration of this of these eternal wisdoms is a key element not just for this nation but for all nations because we're we, we're all lacking that indigenous first principle wisdom that comes from living with nature and by um, you know holding everything sacred around you not just certain things everything was created by the creator um, in your work now, and and what really uh, brought us together and connected us was actually Jim Gale's work, Food Forest Abundance, and the idea that we uh, that we bring self sufficiency or help people uh, bring back to the idea of self sufficiency, living with the land, um, living in in a completely personal, responsible way. How do you see that currently expanding? Do you think we're on a positive path here? And, and do you see people getting fired up about it? They are. It's happening. It's part of the awakening, actually. Jim Gale's work is amazing that <clears throat> promoting permaculture and promoting agriculture, uh, it's something that we're doing here locally in northern Idaho. Um, but the, the critical thing is, is if you look at these battle lines uh, in this spiritual war that we find ourselves in, those that, you know, hop in their jets unapologetically and, and head on to Davos to uh, think up more things that they can do to us, <laughs> to control us. Um, one of their lines of attack that they've really um, honed in on is the food. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they're very high on genetically altered foods. They're very high on synthetic foods, whether it's bug based or it's soy based or whatever. But the things that we make naturally are not of any use to them because those are things that they can't quite frankly control us. If I have my own chickens, my own things growing on the land, if I minimize my use of pesticides or um, I responsibly use um, natural products that can grow these things, there's a couple of byproducts. One is I'm not worried about where my next meal's coming from. So that drops some dependence on government which government doesn't like. And the next one is I'll be healthy and strong. So I'll drop my dependence on pharma because I won't be 
worried that somebody's trying to get into my DNA <laughs> with their nonsense chemicals in the food. And then the third thing is, is um, it, it will help me strengthen and fortify my community with what I'm able to do for them. And therefore it gets back to the same thing, which is uh, there's, there's very little ability if you're able to do these things uh, to control a population. And I think where most people are right now is I can see you trying to control me. I can see over the horizon these other things you have planned for us, like smart cities, 15-minute cities, central bank digital currency, and you want to put these digital handcuffs on me. So my free-range American ideas of permaculture and agriculture must really get under your spine. And so as a strategist and a, and a military general, I would say, well, if it's bothering your enemy, then they should have more of that. <laughs> so that's that's how I see the great work that Jim is doing. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, general, there is a there is always a balance that we need to keep in this w w with this great awakening with moving forward. Now, one is our own individual work that is, you know, truly based in spirit and, and taking care of ourselves, our families and our own lives, which is important. But then there is also the paying attention to what is unfolding in the world. And we have to kind of figure out what is signal and what is noise, right? And right now, there's so much going on, a lot of noise and quite a few signals as well. In, you know, domestically, we have, it would seem like an unusual explosion of explosions, of disasters, um, of, you know, plants burning down. We've seen food processing plants over the last years just skyrocketing, which plays into what you just shared. We see environmental things that are happening that are contaminating the, the air, the soil, we also have a big thing going on in Ukraine, which you speak a lot about as a Newsmax contributor. And um, we have the WHO thing that is unfolding in front of our eyes where a non-elected UN body sitting in Geneva wants to basically uh, you know, dictate, illegally binding, uh, dictate to its 194 member states what they have to do when they declare a health emergency. What are the signal? What is the noise? How do we see through the fog and what should we focus on? Yeah, I think you cut it up the right way. There is a lot of distraction out there. Um, and the distraction uh, could come in dangerous ways uh, where we're all honed in and focused on a Chinese balloon that nobody likes that's sailing over the country and taking pictures of everything and gathering signals. That that. That is, it's very easy to go, oh, that, that's very dangerous. That could be something very dangerous. Meanwhile, food processing facilities are burning down all across the country. Trains are derailing at an alarming rate. Uh, the monies that we have spent as taxpayers for these things to keep us secure are not being spent that way. They're being spent on programs, quite frankly, designed to take us away from our creator, take us uh, oh, and pit us against each other. And I'm talking about woke CRT, diversity, um, uh, inclusion equity programs. I'm talking about um, ESG, environmental social governance. That's the heart of the matter. These are the things that are the real signals because they want to shove them down our throats. And this is how they plan to uh, co-opt the United States and our, and our liberties. But, you know, there's this thing called overreach. And one of the things that they've done, you just tapped right into, which is the WHO saying, oh, well, we're going to amend this existing treaty so that nobody in the United States has to vote on it or has to even blink their eyes. You're already a signatory to the treaty. But this time around, these amendments are going to give us the right to come into the United States anytime we want as an international body and take away your sovereignty and declare that you're a pandemic zone or a, or a, or a hot zone. And we'll just do what we say, and it's not recommended, it's required. So that's that's got Americans very up in arms, and rightly so. And you really should be melting down the switchboard of your congressman. If, if you won't do it for that, what will you do it over? But at the same time, every American should understand that's illegal. It's not enforceable. Those are not the rules. So yes, we could be a party to a treaty that but if somebody changes the terms and conditions of the treaty that goes against our constitution, well, then ergo, we're no longer a party to the treaty, whether the administration wants to say we are or not, it, it really doesn't matter. Now, that doesn't mean this won't get challenged legally. I believe it will. 
it doesn't mean there won't be test cases. But 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 for all Americans who think we just gave away our sovereignty, don't worry, we didn't. Uh, not at all. Uh, we have a document that says so, <laughs> and uh, and they can't change that document not without the proper amount of states or votes or you know uh, to to have an amendment. And they certainly are not in danger of getting to that place. But but what they what I see over the horizon is they're just going to keep pushing, um, and this overreach will continue. I just don't think we're going to have it. So you know Oxford England they're going to do this 15 minute city test where they a person is now in a quadrant of a city and they can only walk 15 minutes in any direction to get all their needs met. Um, and this is going to help save the climate. Well, I got news for everybody. The climate change agenda is really just about putting handcuffs on your hands. Um, but you'll know for five seconds, it'll never keep one of their Gulf 800 jets from getting to Monaco at the right season or getting to the Cannes Film Festival or um, taking a look at the sunsets in Australia. That's for them. That's not for you. And um, and and what what we see in Restore Liberty, especially with our international group, is folks are going to say no. They're going to say, I'm we're not doing this. Um, no matter how many little tests you want, no matter how much media that you use to try to enforce this psychosis on people, it's just falling apart at the seams. And uh, and I it, it's gonna be fun to watch. It's gonna be fun to watch how their overreach brings them down. Um, but it's we, the people that will do that. It's not somebody that who, who said, watch the movie, <laughs> nothing to see here. I, um, but be some scary times ahead for sure. I, I agree. But, but I do have to ask you as a former high ranking military member mm -hmm. with a 30 year career in the armed forces, there is a question that has been asked many times. Um, and if we look at the current situation that we find ourselves in, and, and I'll just point out some very weird anomalies that are yeah. inexplicable. Yes, um, first of all, a very weird anomaly that's inexplicable is that a guy named Joe Biden is in office, apparently in the White House. Very, very weird. But then we also see that guy keeps changing. You know, it's not, you know, and, and, and it is now all but evident that there are multiple people playing the role of Joe Biden. I mean, this is not a conspiracy theory anymore. You can literally see it. You can, you can, you can almost touch it and you can, I mean, verify that. But there are other very strange and seemingly completely unconstitutional things happening. And the question that's been asked so many times, at what point would the United States military step in? What would have to happen for the military to say, hold on here, there's something very strange going on, uh, could even be treason. We don't know, but there's a lot of things that are happening. Um, what would be a reason and what would be the constitutional process if there is one for the United States military to actually step in and say, hold on, we got to, we got to take over for a minute here to see what's going on. Yeah. These are tough questions uh, with regard to the many faces of <laughs> President Biden. It is weird. I mean, it is really bizarre uh, because I've seen a lot of the different pictures and can't account for any of it. What these are areas though, that, you know, I think there's a lot of folks who are in control of major media outlets. They crave when folks in our camp go and focus on that because what they want to do and what they're so quick to do is go label us, oh, it's a tinfoil hat guy. That's an Alex Jones guy. I'll marginalize them by saying, uh, don't you talk about election integrity? Uh, that's the big lie. You're a big liar, or a denier. And they have names and compartments to put us into. And so when things like this, especially with these pictures of the president, who obviously is getting influenced from other directions, um, I, I would say that your, your, you can just hang on because I believe truths that exist like the ones you're talking about, they're going to come to us anyway. So I don't need to take to my Twitter and put out four faces there just as you know, clickbait for CNN to come attack me in the face. <laughs> I mean, they'll do that. But but what I prefer to do is on elements like that, my, my credibility to me and the things that I feel very comfortable talking about are rich enough and good enough that, that the other stuff I already know is going to come to us because the truths are all going to come out. And then to the military point, 
I would watch very closely as to what we see happening right now with these Seymour Hirsch or Cy Hirsch articles coming out on his Substack. Um, you know, he's, you know, love him or hate him. Uh, I don't think many people would throw rocks at his journalistic uh, professionalism or integrity. And he's making some awfully bold assertions about the Nord Stream 1 and 2 demise. And now he's getting backed up by pretty reputable folks like Richard McGovern, um, Jeffrey Sachs. I, you know, I, I'm not very aligned a lot of times with what Jeffrey says. But these are people whose names mean so much to them. And when they come out and they make these assertions, and then you get to the administration that says, no, we weren't a part of that. It never happened. I think as these truths start to come out, um, then what you're talking about, a reevaluation inside the Pentagon, um, we could see that because, you know, the, this is the place that gets us closer to some sort of widening or expansion of the conflict. And we have to be very, very careful here. So, you know, the people in the military, um, they they also swore an oath to this constitution. And I think that many, you know, my privately held opinion is, is that there are quite a few officers and enlisted that, you know, think about that quite often. And and they're watching and they're very smart, intelligent people. And they're watching and seeing what's happening in the country. I, I don't know of any active uh, initiatives, um, but I can say that something like this controversy that's going to get settled maybe at the UN um, could create a change in posture out of out of the military. Well, it's it's to be hoped for. Um, I think that's one of the things that I think the public is often it, it's gotten a little frustrated with. Maybe um, at the same at the same token, and this is what we've talked about here it might inspire people to take action on their own, which is so important. And where your work and all of our work also comes in, you talked about your current project. Um, what is it mainly focused on and how can people support your work or get active themselves? No, well, I appreciate that. Um, so restore-liberty.org is where you can come learn all about us. And um, you'll find that we outline what we believe are today's current 17 usurpations of our Constitution, that we advocate for like-minded governors and legislators to push back on federal overreach and establish a constitutional sanctuary. Um, we get into local school boards, county commissions, city councils, the local levels, because we believe that's the most important place to uh, recruit and support the best candidates in the nation who are really constitutionally minded um, uh, leaders. And this is not a Republican effort. This is a, uh, you could be Democrat, you could be Republican. If, if the constitution and our liberties are important to you, if you understand that we are one nation under God, then, then we're for you. And and we have a heck of a educational arm that not only educates on the Constitution, but also our sheriffs, which have a very special, unique role in the Constitution with their powers. And we just we reach out to make sure that they completely understand how they can protect we, the people, from some of these unconstitutional efforts that are going on. And we see them happen every day in our communities. You know, I, I, I'm astonished at how fast smart cities or the architecture on smart cities is being laid in quietly while nobody's looking. And, uh, and it's time we got to stand up and say, I see what you're doing and it's going to have to stop now. And we insist. I think this, uh, this topic of the smart cities would warrant a, a completely separate uh, conversation because so much of what we're seeing actually ties into that without it being obvious to the right. unsuspicious viewer, but it's restore hyphen liberty.org. Uh, which I encourage everyone to visit. And I do love, especially what you said about the sheriffs, as they are, ac they're actually, you know, they're voted for by the people, they're not appointed. But also, sheriffs have, uh, at least some of them, have shown through these last three years where the last stand it really is and would be. And why it's so important to connect with your local sheriff is because the sheriff would be the line of defense against the federal overreach and could be and has the potential power to deputize hundreds of people on the spot if necessary 
Um, it's it's a powerful line of defense, I think, that should be at least um, considered and kept alive. You know, the connection between the sheriffs and the people. So I love what you said there and, and how you're doing things. I also love that um, your work is very spiritually grounded. And I think uh, th that's why we feel so connected. And we want to thank you for that. I think that's what is needed today. It's a holistic approach. It is. To, to the problems that we face and that's going to actually bring about uh, the right solution. So with that, General Holt, I give you the floor. What is your parting message for our viewers today? So I know that times are really difficult right now. And quite honestly, I think we're going to be challenged even further and deeper in meaningful ways. But if you come back to the basics, if you reestablish your uh, relationship with God, if you reinvest yourself in your local community in ways that you can pull people together, not divide them. And I'm talking, go give a hug to that woke third grade school teacher. Go on over to your um, the person who's completely on the other side and try to find where we can bring people together because this is the resilience that we need. Um, I'm so thankful for you and Christine and, and this channel and this platform because it's inspired me for years now, and I think it just touches and reaches out to so many Americans. Um, and if folks want to come read my stuff once or twice a week on Newsmax, I have a blog site there called The Irascible Disruptor. Uh, and uh, The Irascible just means, yes, I'm angry at the current situation and I want to see it changed. And we will do that with our good spirits, our good humor, our faith, our faith in each other. And uh, and then when you think of those things, John, there's nobody on the face of the planet that can be. Oh, amen to that, sir. General Blaine Holt, thank you so much for joining us today. It was inspiring. Um, it was, you know, life changing for those who are actually listening with eyes to see and ears to hear what is really happening right now. And we have wonderful people like the general everywhere, but. It will require your involvement where you feel inspired to get involved. Please do it today. Please check out uh, restore-liberty.org. Read what the general has to say on his blog on Newsmax. I think it will inspire you. Thank you once again, General Holt, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, my honor. Always at your service. And Inspired Tribe, thank you so much for tuning in. You know we love you. We appreciate you. And we'll be back with you again very, very soon. We're more dedicated than ever to provide authentic, truthful, and uncensored information and inspiration. That's why we created the Inspired Community on the free speech platform, Locals. There's no censorship, a free flow of information, and it's more personal and intimate. And you can join us as a free member or a paid supporter. Please visit inspired.locals.com and join us today.